today we're um, grateful to, to be joined by um, Dr. Kelly. He went to his undergraduate at Cornell University and received his PhD from the University of Virginia. Um, after a postdoc fellowship at the University of Washington, he was an assistant professor in um, the Department of Cell Biology at Georgetown. And then he moved to the NIDCD, where he was first the acting chief and then the chief section on developmental neuroscience. Um, he has done extensive research on the cellular and molecular development of the mammalian cochlea, and he'll be talking to us about that today. Yeah, thank you for the, the very nice introduction and the chance to talk to you guys. I'm really glad we were able to reschedule this after we had to postpone in March. Um, so as you mentioned, as Robin mentioned, my lab's interested in the development of the inner ear. Um, and before talking about that, I wanted to sort of set a sort of patient, patient-centric context for why the research we're doing is worthwhile. Um, just uh, to start off with disclosures, I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Decibel Therapeutics. Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, sort of patient, a basic centric thinking about this, hearing loss is a significant and growing problem, and certainly in first world countries, right? So roughly 30% uh, of individuals over the age of 65 growing to 47% of individuals over the age of 75 are thought to have clinically relevant hearing loss. That's hearing loss that has a role in, you know, sort of impacts their daily lives. Um, while some of that hearing loss can be uh, temporary, the large, vast majority of it is permanent, and that's because of loss of hair cells, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Uh, certainly in the United States, this is a problem that is not going to go away, right? We have um, uh, roughly 60, we're going to go from about 63 million to 95 million people by 2060 who are over the age of 65. And on top of the obvious problems with hearing loss in terms of uh, social isolation and depression, a number of studies recent, that have been done recently, many by Frank Lynn at Johns Hopkins, have established a very strong link between uncorrected hearing loss and a significant increased risk for dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So really raising the, sort of raising the bar and the urgency to try and figure out a way to fix hearing loss um, in this growing aging population. All right, so as I said, a number of factors can contribute to hearing loss, but the one that makes it permanent is loss of hair cells, um, mechanosensory hair cells. Now, hair cells are not unique to humans or to mammals. All vertebrates express essentially the same type of hair cell, the, the mechanosensory receptor. But mammals are unique in, in a bad way in our ability to not regenerate auditory hair cells. And I'll just show you an example of this. So this is uh, a summary of a few studies that were done uh, quite some time ago now by two labs, Jeff Corwin's at UVA and Ed Rubel's at the University of Washington, looking at hair cell regeneration in the in the avian inner ear. So this on the left is a paint fill of an avian inner ear. You can see the three semicircular canals. And then rather than having a coiled auditory organ like mammals do, you have this extended sort of banana-shaped uh, auditory organ called the basilar papilla. Um, it's blown up here, as you can see in the slide. And if we go to high magnification, you can see that basically the entire thing is just filled with hair cells. So every little white dot here is a single hair cell. Um, if you take this bird and you put it in a sound booth for uh, several hours and then bring it out, you can create a lesion that looks like this in the, in the epithelium. And you'll see a corresponding loss of frequency of, of auditory sensitivity in this region. But if you go back to a you know, bird that's been had the same exposure, obviously you can't look at the same thing, look at the ear twice in the same bird. If you go back a month later, a bird with the same exposure, you see that the epithelium looks like this. So you've had a almost complete regeneration of all the hair cells. And at a functional level, the, the auditory perception of this bird has come back as well. And you can deafen birds over and over and over again, and they will repeatedly recover about 98% of their function every time. So mammals are unique in our ability to not recover auditory function in our, in our ears. Um, for a long time, we thought that that was a, essentially an absolute, that once you generated all the hair cells you were going to have in your ear embryonically, they just never came back at all. Uh, that turned out to not be true. Some work from Jenny Stone's lab at the University of Washington about 10 years ago demonstrated that there is a very limited ability for hair cell regeneration in the vestibular epithelia. So this is a, a study that she did where she killed most of the hair cells in the inner ear of a, of a mouse using a diphtheria toxin approach. You can see there are very few hair cells here, the white dots. Over an extended recovery period of about six months, you do get some recovery of hair cells in these utricles. Um, and you can see that in the graph, there's this very gradual recovery of a few hair cells, and then they actually die off a bit after that. 
But there is a very limited possibility for regeneration here in the vestibular epithelium. Um, unfortunately, this does not come with a recovery of function. So you get some new hair cells, but they don't actually help with any sort of, in this case, with vestibular deficits. And as I've said, while there's this limited level of regeneration in the you, in the vestibular epithelium mammals, there is, to the best of our knowledge, absolutely no hair cell regeneration in adult auditory epithelium. But there clearly is a very small amount of, of ability here. So if hair cell regeneration is not going to occur spontaneously, then the development of treatments are clearly going to focus on trying to induce this process to happen. And there are a couple of different approaches that have been taken on this. The first is the uh, what I think is the more obvious one and the one that has the better chance of working, and that is to simply try and understand the natural regeneration process that occurs in non-mammalian vertebrates and try to help re to recapitulate that in, in um, adult ears. And typically, there are two ways that this happens. One is through a round of proliferation, round or two proliferation of supporting cells, followed by differentiation of new hair cells. And the second is an event in which existing supporting cells within the epithelium will actually directly convert into hair cells. Um, so both of these happen in regenerating vertebrates. The other approach that has been considered and has sort of lost favor in the last 10 years or so is the potential use of stem cells, right? So we can now create stem cells from an individual person's macrophages and fibroblasts or from embryonic stem cells. Uh, we can use an organoid approach to generate what look like reasonably bona fide immature hair cells using organoids. And then there can be an attempt made to transplant those cells back into the ear, into a mature ear. Uh, at this point, this, this approach has not matured to a level where it's really looking very viable for a couple of reasons. Um, we still can't make auditory hair cells in organoids. That doesn't work. We can get sort of immature hair cells that look mostly vestibular. And second, delivery has been a real problem. Getting hair cells actually into the, you know, into the space between the basilar membrane and the reticular lamina in the organ of Cordy has been very challenging. And so for the most part right now, uh, most labs are focusing on this, on this first approach. So trying to recapitulate natural regeneration rather than using stem cells. All right, so how can developmental biology help? Well, so my lab and a lot of others believe that the best way to learn how to uh, harness the potential for genetic regulation of making new hair cells is to study the time period where hair cells are normally made during the embryonic period and try to get a handle on the genes that are expressed. So there are a couple of different things that we that a lot of labs are looking at. The first are to try and identify the transcription factors, so the genes that actually turn on other genes that are important for making hair cells. And we sort of think about two different re regions there that were two different areas of interest there. One is the generation of sort of generic hair cells. So as I said, every vertebrate makes a hair cell. We believe that there is probably a basic program that specifies just the sort of baseline hair cell. But then for recovery of auditory function, we're probably going to need to learn how to make those very specialized hair cells within the organ of cordy, so both inner and outer hair cells. And that we expect will take a different set of genes from the basic program. Two other things that are being looked at are one is, are there actually the presence of inhibitory pathways that might normally suppress activation of the hair cell genetic program? And if so, could we, could we potentially inhibit those inhibitors? And then the last one that's getting a lot of, of attention now uh, as we de develop the tools to look at it is, are there changes to the actual epigenome? So are certain chromosomes closed off and is that playing a role in preventing regeneration? And I'll touch on this a little bit, a little bit later on in the talk. Okay, so with that as sort of what we think we can do in developmental biology to help with regeneration, Let's talk a little bit about development and, and just sort of in general. Okay, so here on the top is a paint fill of an adult mouse inner ear. So basically this is a technique that was worked out by my colleague Doris Wu to fill essentially the endolymphatic space in an inner ear with uh, paint and then to clear the rest of the head of the mouse so you can actually see the shapes within the endolymphatic space. And in adult, we can see the three semicircular canals and the endolymphatic duct and sac right here. And then here's the coiled cochlea growing out. And if we cut a cross section here, we can see the structure of the organ of Cordy, inner hair cell here, outer hair cells here, uh, pillar cells, diter cells, um, interphalangeal cells, et cetera. And what we can do is use the same type of analysis to go backwards in time. So these are paint fills from a mouse at the indicated embryonic time points. Just as a reminder, mice are born between embryonic day 19 and embryonic day 21. 
although they don't start to hear until they're about two weeks old. So we're about in the latter, we're in the latter half of embryogenesis here, but the ear will not be fully mature at birth. And what you can see in these paint fills are how the otocyst, right, that fluid-filled sphere that pinches, that develops in the surface ectoderm adjacent to the hindbrain, and then pinches off and begins to develop as the, as the inner ear. And the most relevant change to look at here is this ventral outgrowth that's coming out here and beginning to coil. So this is the developing cochlear duct that's going to give rise to scalar media. And if we take cross sections, similar to the one we have here, we can see what's going on cellularly at these same time points. So here's embryonic day 13. The duct is largely undifferentiated. All the cells are still mitotically cycling at this stage. So you can see mitotic figures. If we look two days later at embryonic day 15, we believe that a fundamental change has occurred in this population of cells right here. So the cells have become post-mitotic, whereas all their neighbors are still proliferating. And we believe that these post-mitotic cells represent the population of cells that will give rise to all of the cells within the organ of cord, both hair cells and supporting cells. So these cells are called prosensory cells, and we believe they're the precursors for the organ of cord cells. And then if we look two days later at embryonic day 17, we can now identify, as you can see by the arrows here, the developing inner hair cell and the outer hair cells right here in the underlying supporting cells. And so what will happen here is between about embryonic day 17 and postnatal day 14, we'll see differentiation and maturation of these different cell types to give rise to this tissue here. So what my lab and others have done is to focus on these time periods here to try and understand what might be the genes that are turned on to drive cells within this from this population into a hair cell phase. And the one I'll tell you about now is the one that's been most intensely studied, and that's a transcription factor called ATO1. So what made ATO1 an appealing gene to look at? Uh, ATO1 is a member of a class of transcription factors called basic helix to helix transcription factors. So they have two conserved domains, a basic domain that binds DNA and a helix to helix domain that uh, allows it to dimerize with other transcription factors. Um, if you look at the roles of basic loop helix transcription factors throughout development in vertebrates and invertebrates, they seem to play a role in helping cells to transition from a proliferative, non-differentiated state into a post-mitotic differentiated state. So consistent with, with, what, with what we'd be looking for in terms of a gene that might be important, important for making hair cells. Finally, the Drosophila homolog of ATO1 is a gene called atonal which uh, coincidentally is required for the formation of cordotonal organs, which are actually the organs that flies used to hear, uh, and also R8 photoreceptors. So again, important roles in specification of important sensory cell types. So ATO1 was an appealing gene to look at in terms of maybe playing a role in hair cell formation. So if we go back to our developmental process and ask about expression of ATO1, what we see is a pattern that's very intriguing. So here, at, there's no expression at E13. This is an antibody against ATO1. We start seeing it first at E15. You can see it in just a few cells here, right within that prosensory domain. If we look by embryonic day 17, now we see ATO1 expression in the nuclei of the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells right here. So very consistent with what we might expect for a gene that's making cells become hair cells. Interestingly, by postnatal day zero, ATO1 protein expression is gone. So we still have, we have our hair cells here, but they're no longer, there's no longer positive for ATO1 protein. They are, uh, interestingly, positive for ATO1 mRNA. So we're actually seeing down regulation of ATO1, not at the, not the level of gene expression, but at the level of protein stability. Um, and in fact, uh, what I'll tell you in a little while, in a few slides later, is that ATO1 is targeted for very rapid degradation during normal development. And so what this creates is a transient expression of ATO1 in cells that are going to become hair cells. Um, it, and it, again, it's expressed very early in their development. Now, as developmental biologists, what we, the two questions we like to ask once we find a gene with an interesting expression pattern is, is it necessary for a process to happen and is it sufficient? And the way that we look at that is to either knock the gene out or to overexpress it. And so that's sort of what we'll talk about next. So this is fairly old data now from about 20 years ago. If you knock out ATO1 in the mouse, in the, throughout a mouse, here's what the inner ears look like. So here's our control. These are the inner hair cells here looking down at the surface. And these are the three rows of outer hair cells right here. And in an ATO1 mutant, there is complete absence of every hair cell. As far as we can tell, in the absence of ATO1, no hair cells ever form in the ears of these mice. So ATO1 is clearly very sufficient as absolutely, absolutely, sorry, is absolutely necessary for hair cell formation. Now, in terms of regeneration, 
The flip side experiment is really the more important one, which is, is ATO1 sufficient to make a cell become a hair cell? And in this context, what we'd be asking is, if we force a cell in the inner ear, say one of these cells, which is an inner sulcus cell, to express ATO1, would that convert, would it force that cell to become a hair cell? This experiment's been done a number of times over the last 20 years um, by a number of different labs, all with essentially the same result. I will show you the results from just one of those experiments. It's one of the ones that I think was the more elegantly done. And that's why we'll focus on this. And this is work that was done by Mike Kelly, who's not related to me. That's not why I think it was elegantly done. Um, Mike was a post was a graduate student with Ping Chen at Emory University. And what he did was to generate a transgenic mouse in which he could turn on ATO1 in every cell in the inner ear by feeding the mice doxycycline. So at any time he wanted, simply by giving them this particular molecule. And so here's a result of one of Mike's experiments. What he did, so the green here is basically showing you that ATO1 is expressed in every cell in the inner ear which you can see here. And if you start feeding, if you feed docs to the mice beginning on postnatal day one and look about a week later, here's what the inner ear looks like. So here are the regular hair cells. Here are these inner sulcus cells. And you can see that thou uh, hundreds of them have been converted into new hair cells, which are expressing this little red dot. So this then very nicely shows exactly what we would like to see, which is that if you force ATO1 to, if you turn ATO1 on in a cell that normally wouldn't express it, it will turn that cell into a hair cell. Um, so demonstrating sufficiency along with necessity for ATO1. So based on these results, uh, Yoash Raphael's lab about 15 years ago tried the first direct examination of whether ATO1 could be used for regeneration. And what he did was to use a guinea pig model in which he um, chemically killed all the hair cells in the ears of the, throughout both ears of the guinea pig and then used an adenoviral-based vector to force ATO1 expression in one ear and not the other by injecting it into the ear. So these are the results of those experiments. Um, what you can see over here are examples of a control in, in the extreme left in which the regular complement of hair cells is present, and then three examples of inoculated ears showing differing levels of sort of hair cell recovery following the injection of that adenovirus, ATO1 expression virus. Now in a cross section, what, what the Raphael lab showed were some very bizarre looking cells, which you can see here that seem to have components of both supporting cells and hair cells. So you notice these cells span from the luminal surface all the way down to the basement membrane, but they also seem to have some, some stereocilia like bundle structures right here at the top. So some very odd looking cells, which uh, if you ask me, I don't think would actually work very well as hair cells, but this is what was found in the inner ears. What made this study compelling was to look was looking at the ABRs from these mice. So what you're seeing here on the right are the uninoculated ears from these mice. Uh, their ABR thresholds should norm. Uh, sorry, not mice, guinea pigs. Their ABR thresholds should be about down here, and you can see a threshold shift as a result of the pharmacological treatment that led to the hair cell death. Over here on the left are the inoculated ears from these same guinea pigs. Not this one, but these four. And you can see that there's been differing levels of recovery of function within the inner ears of these guinea pigs as a result of the treatment with the adeno virus, with the adeno ato one virus. So this study was published in 2005, and it was the first demonstration ever of a procedure that could actually lead to recovery of function following hair cell death. Um, so it was a fairly exciting result at the time. And it directly led to the development of a clinical trial, a human clinical trial, to examine whether ATO1, an ATO1 adenovector could induce regeneration in a human patient population. Uh, so for this, Yosh's lab, the Raphael lab had worked with Genvec, a company uh, actually based here in, outside of Bethesda. They then sold their, basically their product, their adenovector was purchased by Novartis. And in 2014, Novartis started this clinical trial of CGF-186, which is basically just, um, 166, sorry, which is basically just uh, their adenoviral ATO1 expression vector. So for this trial, what they did is they enrolled a total of 22 patients in a phase one clinical trial, all of whom had severe to profound hearing loss. Each patient was given a single injection of this adenoviral ATO1 expression vector at three different doses, and they were then tracked for two years afterwards. Um, so that was right. So 2014 was a long time ago, uh, the, and the trial was only supposed to last two years. It took a little while to get enough patients. Uh, it took longer. There was at least one stoppage because of a health concern. 
Um, and even after the trial closed, it was quite some time before any of the results were ever posted. They've never been published, the results have never been published, but they were posted at clintrials.gov in March of 20, March 30th of 2021, so during, during the pandemic. All right, so what did the results show? Well, the bad news is while two patients showed a mild improvement in their mild improvement in their hearing, the other 20 showed absolutely no change whatsoever in their hearing or got slightly worse, um, probably through as a result of the pathology, not from the virus. Um, Novartis has made no, no announcements or even given any inkling that they're going to continue to a phase two trial. So they clearly were completely underwhelmed with the results. Um, and I'll show you in a minute some reasons why, that, at least for those of us in the basic science field, we're not surprised by these results. The good news is that, as I said, none of the patients hearing got significantly worse, um, and they had no other serious or non-serious adverse effects. And so what this tells us is that gene therapy is a viable approach for developing treatments for hearing loss or other inner ear deficits. Um, and I can tell you that a number of biotechs are currently using this, using gene therapy as an approach to try and treat, not regeneration, work on regeneration, but to try and begin to treat monogenic uh, mutation variants that lead to hearing loss um, with a gene therapy approach. And I think that's just the first step in what's going to be a, hopefully a very fruitful use of gene therapy to treat hearing loss. All right, so a question that I get a lot is, well, why did the ATO1 clinical trial fail? Um, and sometimes one thing that people will ask me is, well, maybe ATO1 isn't the gene in humans, even though it is in all other vertebrates. Um, and, and a follow-up that they sort of ask is, and if ATO1 is the gene in humans that makes hair cells, why isn't it a deafness gene? So the user, usual answer that I give to that is that if you knock out ATO1 in, the entire, in an entire mouse, that mouse will die about postnatal day zero, right after it's born, not because of any problems with its ears, but with a, because of problems with breathing in the diaphragm. Um, and so I always felt that it was unlikely to find this as a human deafness gene because uh, individuals with a complete loss of ATO1 are non-viable. However, just a few years ago, in a collaboration I have with Karen Offerham's lab at Tel Aviv University, we actually identified a new family of a new family with, with early onset deafness within the first two decades as a result of mutation in ATO1. So this is an Iraqi family. We've been able to trace them over five generations. They lose their hearing. They have some hearing when they're born, but they lose it fairly rapidly during the first two decades. And the reason for that loss of hearing is a mutation in ATO1 um, called C1030 del C. So it's a deletion at the, of uh, C at the 1030 position in the, in the transcript. Um, now this is, if you look at, so one thing we were interested in then is why, why are these people going deaf and why is there is the ideology of their hearing loss different from what we see in the mice. So in the mice, as I said, we never see any hair cells. In these humans, they, in these folks, they have some hearing for a while before they lose it. And so what we did was to start looking at the position of this mutation and what it might be doing to ATO1. And this is a very interesting story, I think. So what I'm showing you over here is the amino acid sequence for ATO1 in a number of different species, including humans. In green here, you can see the basic helix lupelix domain, which as I told you is the part we thought was important for function. And now if I show you where the mutation is, it's actually way down here at the very end of the protein in a region that, uh, that based on functional studies, we thought was not particularly important for ATO1 function. And in fact, if we take the mutated version, the, the mutated version of ATO1 from these patients, and we force its expression in inner sulca cells the same way Mike Kelly did, we can show that it's quite effective at making, it still works quite well at making hair cells. So this is expression of the, the 1030 del C ATO1 in the inner sulcus cells, and it's turning most of them into hair cells. So it's still, ATO, this version of ATO1 still works to make hair cells. Um, so that's clearly not the problem. So what we then started wondering about was the possibility that maybe ATO1 is sticking around too long in these patients. Remember I told you that transient expression of ATO1 seems to be important for normal development. If um, and that what happens after ATO1 turns on is it's very rapidly degraded um, post-translationally to create this transient expression. And the reason we thought this might be the case is because of a couple of papers that had been published that had demonstrated that these three serines, when phosphorylated, lead to rapid degradation of ATO1 protein. And so we thought, well, this mutation is pretty close to here. Maybe it's having an effect on the protein folding here and having an effect on the ability of uh, this of cells to degrade ATO1 over time. 
So to test that, what we did was to transfect cells with either wild type or the 1030 del C versions of ATIL1. And then after the cells were expressing a fair amount of the ATIL1 protein, block translation and ask what happens to the ATIL1 protein that's in those cells. So that's what we're looking at here. This is basically a band on a gel that's showing you a lot of ATIL1 protein in these cells at time zero when we start blocking for translation. And what you can see in the control is that that protein is fairly rapidly degraded. So the band gets narrower and narrower and narrower over just a few hours. We see a, a rapid degradation of the protein. This is a control to show that we're not just, the cells aren't just dying. So beta actin stays the same. But if we look at the at 1030 del C protein in the same experiment, we see that it barely degrades at all over the same time period. So this mutation has led to a much more stable version of ATO1. And what we think is happening is that ATO1 is then sticking around for too long as these cells are developing as hair cells. And that is bad and leads the cells to eventually degenerate within the first 20 years of life. Um, so a really nifty, uh, a kind of a nice story that, that helps us learn something about ATO1 and, and, its, and its developmental um, regulation and also uh, demonstrates that that ATO1 is in fact required for hair cell formation in humans as well. So that brings us back to this question. It's not that ATO1 is not important for human hair cells. So what might be going on? So I think that a, a key insight here is again from the study that Mike Kelly did. So here's the data I showed you before. Um, you induce ATO1 at P1 and you get all these extra hair cells. If Mike waited a couple of days, if you Mike waited a week or two weeks to do the induction, so at P7 or P14, he got a very different result. So here's the result at P7. He still gets some extra hair cells, but they're all bunched up right against the inner hair cells right here. And they're far fewer here than there were here. And if he waits till P14, now he gets no extra inner hair cells. He just gets a normal looking organ of cordy with one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. So it, as far as we can tell, the transgenic mouse is still working fine and ATO1 is still being turned on in every cell. But what seems to be happening now is that the cells have lost their ability to respond to ATO1. So they can no longer, no longer will expression of ATO1 in that cell make it become a hair cell. Um, so we don't know exactly what's going on yet. It could be that ATO1 needs a binding partner that's no longer expressed. It could be that there's an important post-translational modification. Um, but I think what is the most likely explanation is that the epigenome of these cells within the ear has changed. So their chromatin structure has basically been altered such that ATO1 can no longer access the, the, the downstream targets that it needs to turn on to make a cell become a hair cell. And that's something that my lab and others are starting to look at now by trying to manipulate the epigenome at the same time that we're expressing ATO1. Uh, that's not, not easy or necessarily super safe in terms of what else bad things that might happen, but that's something we're starting to look at in terms of whether changing epigenome can actually improve the ability of ATO1 to induce hair cells, hair cells at older time points. Okay, uh, so just, I'm pretty good on time. So just a quick summary here in terms of ATO1, um, it's, a, it's a transcription factor that's been shown to be expressed in all hair cells in all vertebrates. It's absolutely necessary for hair cell formation. It's sufficient to induce hair cell formation at younger ages. And see, so it appears to lose that, lag, lose that ability as the animal ages. Uh, we've been able to identify ATO1 as a deafness gene in a new family, in a new Iraqi family. And in that case, what we've learned is that the overall um, transient expression of ATO1 uh, seems to be really important in terms of generating stable hair cells. So ATO1 needs to only be on for a short period of time, not for too long. Um, while ATO1 is not going to be the answer for hair cell regeneration, it's uh, its necessity for the initiation of hair cell formation leads me to believe that any regeneration approach is going to absolutely require ATO1 along with potentially other genes. Okay, so coming back to uh, what I wanna do is finish up with some work that's been done more recently in my own lab. Um, and this is trying to move forward, not so much with this question about basic hair cell formation, but with the second question about what are the genes that are required to make specialized hair cell types like inner and outer hair cells? And what we've, you know, one way that we would really like to work on this that we think is the best way to go forward is to try and understand and characterize the genes that are expressed in hair cells as they're developing as inner and outer hair cells. That's been a bit of a challenge, uh, you know, so in the old days, we would sort of guess at genes that were expressed, which is how ATO1 was worked on. Now what we have the potential to do is to actually look at all the genes that are expressed in a cell 
over a, at a different different time point, and then essentially build a trajectory analysis of how that cell is changing its gene expression over time. And the way that we've been doing that is using something called single cell RNA sequencing. So I want to just take a minute to explain this. So basically, in the last 10 years, um, the field has developed ways to characterize gene expression in single cells. And the way that we do that is to dissociate cells and then use a microfluidic device to capture them. So very briefly, what we've done here is to generate a transgenic mouse in which we've labeled the hair cells in red, expressing a red fluorophore that you can see here. Most of the supporting cells are expressing a green fluorophore down here. We then do a careful dissection and dissociation. And what you can see here, if we put those on a plate, is isolated cells. This is a, this was, this is a hair cell. This is a supporting cell. These are non-sensory cells. We can then capture those using a microfluidic device. And we use a commercial platform called the 10X Chromium platform. And basically what that microfluidics device does is to generate droplets, individual droplets, in which each droplet has one cell and something called gem bead. And those are created by flowing your cells and your gem beads through this uh, machine. And basically it uses a heavy oil to create these droplets. And so you're essentially making mayonnaise, so water and oil mixed together. Now, in each of these droplets is a single cell and then something called a gem bead. And the gem bead has a number of different components to it. The one that lets it that lets us do single cell RNA seq is a physical bead that actually is arrayed with thousands of oligonucleotides, so these small runs of DNA. And there are a bunch of different regions here in this DNA. The two that are important are an oligo DT region here. So this is going to capture the poly A tails on mRNAs. So we're only going to get mRNAs and not other types of RNA. And then this region called the 10X barcode. And the 10X barcode is just a string of nucleotides, about 12 nucleotides long. But what's unique about this barcode is every oligo on the bead will have exactly the same nucleotide sequence. So for each bead, the barcode's the same. But as we go from bead to bead to bead, that nucleotide sequence changes. Um, but it's say, again, for every oligo on a bead, it's the same. So after we've captured our mRNAs, we'll convert those into cDNAs, which we need for sequencing. And during that conversion, we'll not only capture the data on the gene that was there, but we'll also capture that, that 10x barcode. So when we send those, when we send that, send all those, all those mRNAs that we've converted in cDNAs off for sequencing, when the data comes back, we not only get data on the gene, so the sequence for the gene, but we get the barcode data. And so we can say all these genes that express the same barcode came from the same droplet and therefore from the same cell. And so this way we can sequence, we can capture and sequence thousands of cells and figure out which genes were expressed in which cell by simply aligning the barcodes that we get back. Um, and so there's some data here on how we do this. Uh, essentially we load about, I don't think we have it here. We um, Essentially you get about 50,000 reads per cell. So fairly low levels of reads, but we get, and that gives us data on about 2000 genes. Um, but it gives us a very nice overview of the cells that we've captured. So we can then start analyzing that data to try and identify developing hair cells, which is what we're interested in. So this is one of a number of different ways to, um, uh, which is called the dimension reduction, dimensional reduction plot, which basically is going to show us data on, you know, every, we have get lots and lots of data here. So data on thousands of cells, thousands of genes for thousands of cells. So this dimensional reduction plot helps us understand or visualize highly dimensional data in just two dimensions, which humans can handle. Basically every dot on this cell, every dot on this graph represents data from a single cell. Dots that are the same color are uh, through, through bioinformatic analysis determined to have very similar transcriptional uh, profiles. And we can then use this data to identify the cells that we care about. And in this case, these are the developing outer hair cells and inner hair cells over here and here. Um, and what's interesting here at P1, which is when we did this study, is our outer hair cells are not sort of clumped up in a circle. They show this sort of elongated array here. And that turns out to reflect changes in the developmental stage of those cells. So hair cells don't develop along the cochlea at the same rate. The ones at the base develop first and the ones at the apex develop last. So if you collect at a time period like P0, you get some cells that are more mature and some cells that are less mature. And so we're seeing that here in this array of cells right here. To build a better understanding of how hair cell development goes on, what we did here was to collect from three other time points. Um, so here's embryonic day 14, embryonic day 16, and P7. 
and the hair cells, the outer hair cells are circled in each one of these time points. And what we can do now, right, is we have data on thousands of cells for every one of these dots. We can then take the data from these four time points, combine them back together into a new data set, and then use bioinformatics to actually create a developmental trajectory in terms of changes in gene expression for outer hair cells as they go from least mature to most mature. And so that's what's shown over here. These are all of our hair cells now in just one group. And what we can see is that they sort of go along this arc like this. Um, if we plot them based on time that they were collected, which you can see over here, what we see are the less mature cells are on the left. We then move through, so E16 and E14 and E16. Here are our P1 cells. And then there's this rather irritating gap here, which we're having to go back and fill in. And then here are the P7 cells. But we have a nice uh, array, uh, nearly a linear array along two dimensions as the cells are developing from least mature to most mature. And so we can use that then to basically create a timeline of development of hair cells, not based on actual time, but based on changes of gene expression. And that's referred to as pseudo time. And we can then, once we have the pseudo time axis, which you can see here, we can then analyze gene expression, overall gene expression as hair cells are developing. That's what's shown here. So what we see are essentially three phase, four phases of hair cell development. So we see some genes that are turning off early in development, two phases of transient gene expression, and then a final phase of genes that turn on and stay on. Um, and so that can be depicted graphically like this. These, these are our four phases. And what we think is going on is that these are genes that are expressed in those prosensory cells that are being turned off. We think that this first phase of gene expression is probably the sort of more generic specification of hair cells. So ATO1 is one of these genes. These we think might be more specialized cell types. And then finally, these are genes that seem to be involved in hair cell structure and function. So transduction changes and things like that. So what we can do next is we can ask within these different uh, phases of hair cell development, what are the transcription factors that are expressed? And so this just shows you a bioinformatically generated table of transcription factors that are expressed in each one of these phases of development. Um, if you look through, yeah, so this is what I just told you about what we think is going on in each one. If we look at this panel, we can find some of what I refer to as the usual suspects. So these are genes that we already know well to be involved in hair cell development. But we then also find a number of new genes that we can now look at and ask whether they also play roles. And I'm going to finish up by telling you about one of these genes. And that's this gene here. It's a zinc finger gene called CASZ1 that we pulled out. So why was this gene intriguing? Um, so CASZ1 stands for castor zinc finger 1. It's a zinc finger transcription factor. In Dros the Drosophila homolog, which is called castor, um, acts to basically modulate changes in um, cell fate development in developing neuroblasts. So it plays a role in specification of different types of cells in the developing nervous system of the fly. Uh, in vertebrates, it regulates cell fate specification in a number of systems, including neuroblasts, retinal progenitors, T helper cells, and cardiomyocytes. Uh, mutations in the patient population in CAS Z1 lead to neuroblastoma. And finally, it's been implicated as a possible causative gene in chromosome 1p36 deletion syndrome, which can include sensory neural hearing loss. So this was a really intriguing gene for us to go after. If we go back to our uh, our developmental expression for outer hair for hair, outer hair cells here, we're, now we're looking at a lookup table expression of CASZ1. So the redder the cell, the more CASZ1. You can see it has this expression here that turns up about P0, sticks around to some extent into the more mature one, more mature outer hair cells here. If we do an in situ hybridization to look for mRNA for CASZ1, we can see that it very nicely lines up with developing hair cells. In these two cross sections, uh, CCER2 and parvalbumin are known markers of hair cells. They're in purple. And here's CASZ1 at E15 um, in, it's being expressed in early hair cells. And then here at E18, still expressed in the hair cells. So nice validation of the single cell data um, and a clear demonstration is expressed in the hair cells. So what we wanted to do next then was to eliminate CASZ1 and ask whether that had effect on outer hair cell development. Um, CASZ1 mutant mice die uh, right after birth um, because of problems with breathing. So what we did was to use a, a Cree, um, sorry, a Cree locks or, or flox approach to generate a deletion that was largely restricted to the inner ear for CASZ1. And we did this using something called an EMX2 Cree driver. So basically we're only deleting CASZ1 in a few systems. 
And what we see in the mutants here are some, the hair cells are clearly present, but we do see some defects in their development. So here's our wild type inner hair cells, outer hair cells at P0. This is where the pillar cells will form. And here in the CASI1 mutants, we have inner and outer hair cells. Turns out they look a little bit delayed. So the hair cells are a bit smaller. The pillar cell space is not as wide as it should be. And if we measure the luminal surface area of the hair cells, we can see a significant decrease in both inner and outer hair cells in terms of that luminal surface area. So they're having a, de they're having a defect in overall development in terms of the pace at which they're developing. Uh, if we look then in the adult, this is about P45, we still see developmental defects. So as the, as the cochlea goes from sort of this postnatal time point to the more mature, uh, mature structure here, the hair cells and sporting cells actually tighten up to create a, a more narrow epithelium. And that's not happening in our CASI1 mutants. We're also seeing some patterning defects, as you can see here. So ongoing defects in, in hair cell development. Now, what's more relevant is if we then look at actual function of the inner ear in these mice by doing either ABR or DPOAE, we see a significant threshold shift for these animals. So here are auditory brainstem responses for our wild type mice at three different frequencies. And here are P45 CASI1 mutants. And you can see there's already about a 30 dB threshold shift at a number of frequencies here. Similarly, if we look at outer hair cell function by looking at autoacoustic emissions, we also see almost a complete loss of autoacoustic emissions. So here's our wild type uh, DPOAE, and here's the mutant. So basically, it's just sitting right at the north floor. So significant defects in auditory structure and function in the absence of CAS-Z1. Now, right now, we've entered into a collaboration with Botan Bonfi's lab at the University of Iowa, who was also interested in this gene, we learned at a meeting. Um, and we're moving forward and looking at both changes in genetic regulation in CAS-Z1 mutants. And also, we've learned that the hair cells start to degenerate um, probably by about P60. So uh, very important roles for CAS-Z1 in development and function of, inner, in function of the inner ear. All right, so that's the last of my data slides. Um, just to conclude, I, I tried to convince you the developmental biology, I think, has the potential to really provide us with guiding, uh, with important guides in terms of how we're going to address regeneration. Um, ATO1 is really a key, we believe is a key to any sort of making of hair cells, and we think that's going to be important for regeneration moving forward. I just touched on the fact that we, it looks like epigenetic changes in the in, hair, in the genome of cells within the inner ear probably is playing a role in limiting the ability of beta one to induce regeneration. Um, my lab has been using the single cell RNA sequencing approach to try and understand with much finer detail what the different genetic cascades are that are required to make hair cells during normal development, with the idea that these are probably pathways that we're going to need to leverage to try and induce regeneration. And I showed you one example of how we're, how that's worked out for us and that we've been able to identify a new deafness gene, CAS-Z1, um, using that single cell approach. And obviously we have a lot of other genes to look at uh, and moving beyond hair cell regeneration, um, we're looking at the supporting cell, um, development of supporting cells as well, because that may be important also. Uh, and finally, I just want to briefly mention the folks that did all the work in the lab. In particular, uh, here's Mike Kelly, who came to work in my lab after doing his work with Ping Chen. Mike and Lakeitha Kola were instrumental in the single cell data that I talked to you about. Uh, the ATO1 study that I, the ATO1 work that had been done in my lab was done by Betsy Driver, who's a staff scientist in my lab. And the CASI1 work was done by Betsy Driver and Rebecca Hip, who's right over here in the inset, um, who's a former postdoc in the lab. Uh, as I said, as I mentioned, uh, I have a collaboration with uh, Karen Avraham at Tel Aviv University, which is where we did the human work. Uh, and these are just some of my other collaborators and Botan, those I mentioned, we're working on now with CAS-Z1. And finally, I'd like to thank the NIDCD Sequencing Corps, who provides us with invaluable help with all of our genomics and transcriptomic analysis.